one of Australia's many island paradises. This remote and serene jewel in the South Pacific is Norfolk Island. Here, time largely stands still and allows man unlimited pursuit of pleasure. How many you got on there? I got three on. You, but the price yeah. of pleasure and paradise can often be high, as an island resident, Max Inglis, discovered. I started to feel a little uh, nausea and uh, it seemed to develop into a pain in my chest. And uh, I said to Barry, I said, this pain in my chest, I said, it's, uh, it's gone into my shoulder. I said, it's getting worse. Barry leaned over the back of the seat and he looked at me and he said to me, he said, you look as though you're bloody dying. He said, you, you're having a heart attack. I said, oh, I'm not having a bloody heart attack at all. The heart attack proved so serious that Max Inglis needed better medical care and facilities than Norfolk could offer. But safe and quick transport to them required a special aeromedical service. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for Raph Medivac, I wouldn't be here doing this, fighting this uh, line-up. If the plane hadn't have come in, I'd have been horizontal at the end of quality rail. And you know what's at the end of quality rail. <laughs> A Royal Australian Air Force aeromedical evacuation flight gave Max Inglis a fighting chance. Our vast continent and numerous offshore islands have served to disperse the Australian population and isolate many from the medical centres of metropolitan Australia. For many of the desperately ill, aeromedical services provide the only means of reaching them quickly and safely. Civil authorities have the prime responsibility, but frequently the Royal Australian Air Force assists when pressurised aircraft and greater aeromedical facilities are essential to the preservation of ailing life, or when the afflicted, like Max Inglis, are beyond the reach of civil aeromedical services. An Air Force medivac flight brings the ultimate in aeromedical care. It provides not only a large, fast pressurised aircraft, but the medical skills and equipment required to preserve the lives of each individual patient. In Max's case, a resuscitation specialist, an anaesthetist, a highly trained aeromedical nursing staff and sophisticated heart monitoring equipment. And the effort was appreciated. The whole crew were dedicated, efficient, fantastic. I couldn't speak uh, highly enough about them. But I thank God, I think, the Medivac uh, team and I thank uh, the fact that they were uh, here in, on the time they were because the specialist said, had they not brought me in when they did, I wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't have lived through uh, another 24 hours. Air Force responded to the emergency within hours and the rescue aircraft, a giant C-130 Hercules, was ready to make the 1,700 kilometre return journey to Sydney immediately the patient had embarked and was prepared for the flight. Uh, Alex and James, would you put it on six feet, please? Mr Inglis, we'll put you on oxygen for the flight. How does that feel? Okay. Flight time to Sydney, three hours. But the aeromedical team will maintain Max in intensive care until he reaches his ultimate destination, the Royal North Shore Hospital. Max, how are you feeling now? Okay. Comfortable? Yeah. I want you to let us know if you get the slightest bit of pain. Right. OK? Well, You're right at the moment, no pain at all? Well, pain. Max is only one of hundreds of Australians whose lives have been saved by an RAAF aeromedical evacuation flight in the past few years. They, like Max, have experienced the ultimate in aeromedical care, unique expertise developed by the Royal Australian Air Force during the past 40 years to give our battle casualties a fighting chance. Many fell in South Vietnam, but Air Force Medivac was at the battlefront to help. Delta Foxtrot, this is Zero Bravo. Request dust off. Dust off, the cry for air rescue of a fallen Australian. I suppose uh, when you get the, the term dust off, the heart beat fast for a little while and you concentrate it and uh, 
got on with the job, uh, the aeroplane could be airborne within two minutes. Uh, it was a strange sort of nursing uh, because it was so rough and ready. We have to get in and get out as quickly as we could. Yeah, we got shot out freezing the wreck. You'd be normally looking at from lift up to approximately 20 to 25 minutes when the aeroplane would be overhead. As far as the, the diggers were concerned, uh, pretty, pretty good sort of service. Most of them you know, were really pleased to see us, the conscious ones. A man with a gunshot wound is, is not happy Joe, but uh, the feeling uh, I found most uh, was the uh, nine times out of ten was a relief, look of relief on a soldier's face. He could feel the aeroplane pulling away from where he was. Dustoff operated around the clock to deliver casualties within the hour to surgical and medical experts in nearby highly capable field hospitals. Dedication and concern provided the greatest measure of care possible on every mission. And the in-flight phase didn't need much more than their handheld and reassurance. But some of them, yeah, we had to work pretty hard on them. Obviously the comfort of the patient was uppermost in the crew's mind, but times it was just impossible you sometimes you know the numbers we pulled out uh, you know, we'd simply just overload the aircraft we'd cram people wherever you had to we knew if we could get them back they had you know every chance of coming out 97 and a half percent of casualties survived but other Australians who fell in previous great conflicts had far less chance well it was really a battlefield. Especially in the desert. We were an open target all the time. The, the biggest damage was done with the artillery fire sitting in the trenches. It was a case of have to survive or else. We didn't have any of the hospital facilities for the amount of wounded in that. I think it was 26 come out. About 126, 130, something like, came out of the battalion. One in five did not come home. 68% became casualties. More than a quarter of those injured in battle perished, but not for the want of human endeavour. Mechanised transport and medical science were insufficiently developed to provide the speed and quality of care required by many. Wounded men could not get blood transfusions in the field. There were no effective infection-fighting drugs. Field hospitals were mostly remote and primitive, and more adequate general hospitals often hundreds of miles away. The inadequacies were recognised, but largely they were beyond satisfactory resolution in that era, despite the life-saving potential that the developing aeroplane offered. They were just frail skeletons then, clothed in canvas, and mainly used to destroy life rather than preserve it. But despite their severe mechanical limitations, they did an effective job. The aeroplane remained a vehicle of destruction until 1915, when a courageous young French aviator, Captain Dogozar, found a more humane purpose for it, an aerial ambulance. In the face of the advancing enemy, he strapped a wounded Serbian pilot to the fuselage of his frail aeroplane and flew him to safety. Either through desire or need, aeromedical evacuation had been born. But the idea would fail to develop in World War I. The road to recovery would remain perilous and difficult for many wounded Australians. Great drive, determination and courage enabled some to defeat the hazards, but many never came back. they would not be forgotten. Their tragedy and the experience of the Great War would inspire remarkable advancement in aviation, transport and medical science, which would give Australian casualties a much greater chance of recovery in World War II. Casualties could be given blood transfusions in the field, the wonder drug penicillin was available to fight infection and motorised transport to rush the injured to nearby surgical and medical stations. But of even greater value was a military air ambulance service. 
Three Royal Australian Air Force DH-86 aircraft formed our first air ambulance squadron and airlifted 9,000 casualties from the Middle East theatre to pioneer Australian aeromedical evacuation. Air transport proved an asset by reducing the time between injury and definitive care, but it also introduced some unique disadvantages. Reduced atmospheric pressure, noise, low humidity, variable temperature, lack of oxygen, turbulence and vibration often proved detrimental to the preservation of ailing life. Time would be needed to recognize and resolve all of the difficulties, but the Pacific War would provide much of the experience needed, especially in Papua New Guinea. Australian casualties totaled over 235,000, but for many more reasons than battle injury. The war in New Guinea was a different war altogether. You've got rivers, crocodiles, disease, water and everything else there, the whole thing against you there. Very difficult. And then malaria, dengue fever and all those sort of things there. Those are the things that made people go tropo in New Guinea. Disease and pestilence accounted for 95% of casualties and many of these, with others injured in battle, would have perished but for aeromedical evacuation. DC-3 aircraft airlifted thousands back to Australia. But the service, despite every effort by conscientious and devoted nursing staff, remained relatively primitive. There was still little understanding of the physiological effects that flight had on the human body. And such knowledge is essential for safe air transportation of the critically ill. Years of research would be required to identify and resolve all of the difficulties. But despite them, World War II aeromedical evacuation was largely successful. Some were lost, but for most the service offered great advantages. Korea would see vast improvements in aeromedical techniques, but the ultimate would be achieved in South Vietnam. Ninety-seven and a half percent of Australian casualties survived, an achievement largely made possible by Air Force aeromedical evacuation. It enabled our wounded to be assisted within minutes of injury by expert medical skills and facilities and brought them back safely to Australia for advanced treatment as soon as their condition permitted it. Most were sufficiently stabilised within three weeks to make the journey, but movement was subject to aeromedical assessment of the individual patient by an experienced Air Force doctor. Evaluation took into consideration the specific injuries, potential in-flight physiological hazards and medical requirements of each patient. And it also prescribed the level of care, treatment and specialised equipment required to preserve life during flight. None were lost during the 8,000 kilometre return journey to Australia, but many required intensive and specialised care throughout. Vastly improved aircraft and aeromedical practice provided the measure of care required. Do you want a drink yet? No, thank you. Nothing. How's the arm going? Sore. A little bit sore. Do you want anything for pain yet? Okay. Do you want a drink or anything? Yes, you would. Shall I see caviar? Shall I come down here, please? Come on, mate. Come on, Gordon. Just take it easy. I'll make it seven. The alien environment of flight seriously disadvantaged some, but an informed and experienced aeromedical nursing staff willingly, kindly, and competently catered for the needs of each patient. Come on, take it easy. You'll be right. Easy. Just relax. No, Come on. Like Breathe slowly. That's it. That's a stuff. Good. Everything's okay there. Come on. That's better. Competent aeromedical nursing requires a thorough understanding of what altitude, aircraft noise and vibration it's does to the now. injured human body and how these physiological disadvantages can be remedied in the individual. But it also demands anticipation of specific trauma and the availability of equipment, materials and medicine to overcome the hazards. You okay there, Blue? It's a, it's a bit wet down there, sister. Yeah, it's cleaning just a little bit. Five girls! Yeah, sir. Can you get some reinforcing, please? Just yeah, stop my cleaning. Wife. All right, Jock. Just a little trickle, mate. Don't worry. You're all right. Just relax. Good fixing, mate. Nice and tight. Like drink. 
A small complement of nursing staff capably managed up to 50 litter-borne and walking wounded on each flight. But with so many to care for, demands were often great. The seriously ill required constant care and attention. But others, less debilitated, also had needs. Bloody odd, isn't it? Yeah, I'll see if I can get the air conditioning turned down. All right. How are you going now? Oh, pretty good, thanks. All right? Yes, sir. You wanting more fluid? No, I'm not. You're right. How are you going now? Not too bad, thanks. Okay. Not too much longer. We should be landing shortly. Can you get the... Throughout the Vietnam conflict, especially configured and equipped C-130 Hercules transport aircraft were used to aeromedically evacuate our wounded each fortnight and sometimes more frequently. Direct return to Australia was practical but for the benefit of the casualties flights were undertaken in two stages and those incapable of continuing the journey were rested before being flown to advanced medical facilities in metropolitan Australia. All 3,500 casualties arrived safely and the wartime experience has served to benefit many other Australians since. But it was unreal. I can't really describe what it was like going in. The things that really got me were uh, metal lampposts bent over at angles of greater than 45 degrees. You've got no idea of that, why the houses were flattened and uh, semi-trailers tipped upside down. Uh, you know, things just squashed. It was really unbelievable. Uh, wires everywhere, trees with no leaves on them, and uh, of course we'd never seen people with as much blood and gore and sick as that. 49 were dead, hundreds were injured, and devastated Darwin hospitals were unable to cope. It was the scenario of war, hundreds of casualties in a remote and ruined city, and only practiced military skill was competent to help the victims quickly and effectively. The first Air Force aeromedical evacuation flight to assist the Cyclone Tracy victims arrived within hours of the disaster and immediately airlifted the most critically injured to the safety of Sydney Metropolitan Hospitals. So began the largest peacetime aeromedical evacuation in Australian history. Air Force aeromedical teams and air crew worked tirelessly around the clock and in three days they'd rescued 257 seriously ill and hundreds of walking wounded. All survived their injuries and many owe their lives to the skill of Air Force Aeromedical Evacuation, a service which exists to benefit all Australians in both war and peace. Air Force Aeromedical Evacuation has helped and will continue to help the Defence Force, civil communities and even individuals like Max Inglis when circumstances require it. Uh, there's a lot of people like myself who uh, feel very secure living on a remote place like this, knowing that... Uh, Knowing that Medivac does exist, and uh, I certainly, uh, it, as I said before, to reiterate, it meant a good difference to life and death to me.